The Hornet sent 14 dive bombers against the Japanese fleet, and the Lexington sent 15 dive bombers and 6 torpedo bombers. The Hornet's planes attacked the Zuikaku and damaged her so seriously that Admiral Ozawa at one point thought he was going to have to abandon ship. The order was given, but as men were going over the side, the fires were brought under control by the damage control parties, and the order was rescinded. Zuikaku lived to fight another day. The planes of the Lexington attacked the smaller carriers Ryuho and Junyo and reported many bomb hits on them, but neither ship was sunk. Four torpedo bombers from the Langley joined in the attack, but carrying bombs, not torpedoes, and so did two from the San Jacinto. They too headed for the carriers, although some of the Langley's planes bombed the Nagato, the big battleship. The whole action lasted only about 20 minutes. At the end of it, the Americans had sunk one carrier and damaged three, the Chiyoda, Junyo and Ryuho. They had damaged a battleship and a cruiser and sunk two oilers. The damage would have been much greater and the American victory much more spectacular had Admiral Mitcher been prepared to launch torpedo-laden bombers. But for two days those bombers had been making search missions and no one had expected that the Japanese fleet would be encountered under such difficult conditions late in the day, at extreme range, with no time for rearming. As it was, Admiral Ozawa knew he was defeated, and he headed for Okinawa as soon as he had recovered the handful of aircraft remaining to him. Of the 100 planes available that afternoon, half had been lost in action, deck crashes on landing at night and water landings. The Ago plan had begun with high hopes for victory, it had ended in numbing defeat. Late on the afternoon of June 21, Admiral Mitcher had asked Admiral Spruance to release the battleships and cruisers to make a night attack on the Japanese fleet. With his characteristic conservatism, Spruance had refused, and the American battle line remained harnessed, with no chance to strike the enemy. The Japanese were far less timid. Admiral Ozawa had instructed Admiral Kurita, his battleship commander, to seek a night engagement, and at dark, Kurita began charging toward the Americans. He launched ten reconnaissance planes to find the American fleet and steamed ahead toward battle. But at eleven that night, Admiral Ozawa recalled Kurita and ordered him to turn about and follow the carriers back to Japan. Thus was avoided a major confrontation of big warships. Mitcher had wanted to finish the job and put the Japanese fleet out of action. He could have done so, given a different fleet commander, but Spruance was content to have destroyed the threat to the Marianas' invasion forces, and by dark it was all over. As the strike ended, Mitcher cancelled all plans for another. It was too late, the enemy was retiring, and he still had the wind working against him. In order to recover planes, he had to steam directly away from them, and away from the Japanese. The irony was that the planes, coming from the end of their range, were all short of gas, and a mile or two might mean the difference between a carrier landing and a splash in the sea. But there was absolutely nothing to be done about it. The wind this day had all been with the Japanese. The returning planes were to be brought in by radio beams, and about 100 miles out they began to pick them up. But knowing where the carrier was and making it back to deck were two different matters this night. Darkness had set in before 8pm, and the sky was overcast, which hampered the pilots more. Halfway back to the carriers, the planes began to ditch. The first to go down were those which had suffered damage in the fight, particularly those which had lost a wing tank or had gas tanks punctured. An hour after dark, the planes began to arrive over the carriers, but then the confusion began. Some pilots, unused to making night landings, ploughed their planes into the barriers and fouled the decks. This was the situation that faced Commander Ramage and his dive bombers when they arrived over the Enterprise. They were ready to land, but they got a wave off from the landing signal officer. The deck was fouled and they could not land. The planes had to find other carriers to take them, because they could not last very long with their gas supply almost gone. Ramage and the others did, except one. Lieutenant Bangs did not have enough gas to wait around, he came in on Enterprise in the landing pattern, got a wave off, and before he could find another carrier, he ran out of gas. He ditched not far from his ship. When the plane went in, Bangs hit his head on the gun sight and split his forehead open, but he did not black out and escaped the sinking plane. He was in the water for 30 minutes, 
then was picked up by a destroyer. His head was patched up with six stitches, and next day he was delivered safe and nearly sound to the carrier. Most of the Enterprise fighters were fortunate, and a dozen of them had flown out under Commander Kane's supervision, and eleven of them landed safely aboard various carriers. Ensign J.I. Turner joined up with several other fighters after the strafing dives, and they ran into a pair of Zeros, which started shooting. One Zero attacked Ensign Turner's plane, and the bullets severed an oil line. In a few seconds, the windshield was spattered and the cockpit was dripping in oil. Turner dove for the water, stayed down, and flew about 30 miles toward the American task force, and then ditched. He got out of the plane without trouble, inflated his May West and the rubber raft that was kept under the seat, and waited. The five torpedo bombers of the Enterprise had trouble, and when they returned, Lieutenant Eason ran out of gas near the fleet and ditched. He and his crewmen were rescued by the USS Cogswell. Lieutenant Doyle came in with his wheels up and skidded along the length of the flight deck. He and the crew were safe, but the torpedo bomber fighter had to be thrown over the side. Lieutenant Lawton landed safely aboard the Princeton, but Lieutenants Collins and Cummings ran out of gas and had to land in the sea. Two more torpedo bomber fighters were scratched. As the planes came in in the darkness, Admiral Mitcher made the decision to light up the force, so that the chances of an aviator making a successful first pass would be increased. The danger, and he knew it well, was that a Japanese submarine might get in among them and wreak havoc. But luck came back to Admiral Mitcher that night, and no Japanese submarine appeared. Part of the reason for that was the excellent search job already done in the area by destroyers and aircraft. At least two Japanese submarines in this sector had been destroyed several days earlier, but Admiral Mitcher had no way of knowing there were no submarines about, nor any air elements that could damage him. The decision was brave and was remembered. If Mitcher had never done another thing in the war, he would still be beloved by his pilots for that gesture. Unfortunately, it did not help the pilots who were out of gas, except to give them an aiming point for ditching. When the planes of the Bellow Wood came back, Lieutenant Brown was missing. Somewhere out there he had fainted from loss of blood, or the torpedo bomber fighter had given up, for Brown was not seen again. The Bunker Hill had sent out 14 fighters, 12 dive bombers, and 8 torpedo bombers to the battle. Half of them were badly shot up, either by anti-aircraft fire or by Japanese Zeros. 19 of them were lost, which meant that more than half the planes of this carrier's strike failed to return. A dozen of them made water landings, and the pilots were rescued, but at the end of that long day, eleven pilots and air crewmen of the Bunker Hill were either known dead or missing in action. Most of the planes that crashed or landed in the sea had been damaged in the action, and either suffered from excessive drag or loss of fuel. Commander R. L. Shifley, leader of the air group, made the rendezvous after the attack and tried to lead his planes home. Many were separated on the way, and he arrived with a small group. He circled for fifty-five minutes above the Bunker Hill, and waited while the deck was cleared of crashed planes. He came in with 90 gallons of gas in his tanks, but that was a rare exception. The dive bombers took the worst beating. When the Bunker Hill's contingent left the Japanese fleet, only one of the dozen dive bombers was not damaged, either by anti-aircraft fire or fighters. Lieutenant Harwood Sharp's plane was hit in the propeller and carburetor. Gas fumes filled the cockpit, and he had to put on his oxygen mask. His engine cut out five times on the way home, and each time he saved the plane from crashing by nosing over and pumping gas into the system. His engine vibrated violently all the way back, and his compass and most of his electrical gear went out. Lieutenant Arthur Jones found that his tail controls were shot out, and he had to guide the plane home without them. Lieutenant Warren Pilcher had his propeller stuck at 1,600 revolutions per minute, and he never managed to remedy the damage. As the darkness closed in on them, they flew through squalls and heavy clouds, which made it even blacker. Many of the planes had lost their radios, and the circuits were overloaded with pilots asking directions of each other. Gradually, the formation fell apart into twos and threes, and that is how the ones who made it as far as the carrier fleet struggled home. Of the dive bombers of the Bunker Hill, only one, that of Lieutenant Kenneth Holmes, managed to land on a carrier at all. He came in on the USS Cabot at 9.20 that night with 20 gallons of fuel left.
The only reason he made it was that his plane was that single exception that was not damaged in the raid. The Bunker Hills torpedo bombers were a little luckier. Three of them managed to land on other carriers, although one, Lieutenant Lecomte's, landed on Enterprise with a bump. When the plane had stopped and the crew got out, an Airedale plane handler took a reading on the gas tank. It registered zero. Not one torpedo bomber fighter from the Bunker Hill got back to its carrier that night. Four of them landed in the sea, and one crew of three parachuted rather than chance a water landing. Lieutenant Mason made four passes at the Bunker Hill and three at the Wasp before his gas gave out and he had to ditch. There were just too many crashes aboard. Twelve of the Bunker Hill's fighters managed to land on carriers, nine of them on their own. The thirteenth was seen to crash into the water just short of the carrier and explode. The pilot was not recovered, and the other carrier pilots had almost the same experiences. The fighters, with their wing tanks, seemed best equipped for the long-haul home. The dive bombers, carrying heavy loads and without adequate gas supply, had the worst time of it. Hornet's thirteen dive bombers were nearly wiped out. Eight made water landings, and three crashed into the barrier on landing and were destroyed. Battle damage and fuel exhaustion were the causes, and they were not so serious for the fighters. The Bataan, for example, launched ten fighters only for the strike, and all but one returned safely and landed aboard their own carrier. The fouling of the Bunker Hill's decks, and those of most of the other troubled carriers, was a direct result of the fuel shortage and general confusion of the recovery that night. At 8pm, the carrier's combat information centre reported contact with a large number of planes heading toward the task force. The normal precautions were taken, but everyone aboard expected it was the returning strike. Just before 8.30pm, Captain Jeter turned the carrier into the wind and she was ready to land planes. Twenty minutes later, a dive bomber from the Hornet started an approach. The landing signal officer gave the pilot a wave off, because the deck was already full of landed planes, but the dive bomber was out of gas and the pilot landed anyhow. The bomber crashed into the barrier and nosed over, its propeller lodging in the wooden deck and sticking there, and the Airedales tried to move the plane, but it was stuck fast. It was still stuck at 9.06pm, when a torpedo bomber from the Cabot started an approach. The torpedo bomber fighter was waved off, but the pilot paid no attention and came in. As he landed, he saw the crashed dive bomber in front of him and veered to the right to avoid it. This manoeuvre caused the torpedo bomber to hit a gun mount with its right wing. The wing tore off and the bomber skidded into the crashed dive bomber and then turned over on its back and crashed into the island. Commander W. O. Smith and two men were working to free the dive bomber when the torpedo bomber fighter came hurtling in. They were all killed because they were directly in the line of approach, four other men of the Bunker Hill were injured. The pilot of the torpedo bomber fighter was burned but survived, and rescuers got him out and into sick bay. The torpedo bomber fighter and the dive bomber were both total wrecks and had to be jettisoned. And when the Airedales went to the task, they could not remove the body of one of the dead, and it had to go over with the planes. It was half an hour before the Bunker Hill's deck was clear again for landing, and by this time, most of the planes that had come home low on gas had gone into the sea. As Admiral Mitcher assembled the reports from the carriers that night, he learned that the task force had lost 100 of 216 planes sent out in the attack, almost half the force. By far the majority of planes were lost on the way home. Only 20 could be identified as shot down in combat. But 209 men had gone into the water, and that night only 101 of them had been rescued. Pilots and air crewmen were strung out at sea all around the carrier force, and all the way between Task Force 58 and the point of the attack. Having been deprived of the opportunity to strike the Japanese hard again, Mitcher turned his attention to the rescue of his pilots and recommended a course of 16 knots toward the scene of the battle. Spruance agreed, because they might find some Japanese cripples to destroy. His intelligence reports showed two carriers sunk in the attack and two others damaged, one battleship damaged, one cruiser damaged, one destroyer sunk and two damaged, and three oilers sunk and two others damaged. So there might indeed be cripples if his intelligence had been accurate, which it was not by far. That night, patrol planes based on Saipan started searching for the Japanese fleet 
and made contact 325 miles out, but at 16 knots, Task Force 58 would not catch the fleet. Just before six o'clock in the morning, Mitchell launched another strike toward the reported position and course of the Japanese, and a search at the same time, the strike found nothing. The search planes carrying extra fuel tanks and no bombs did make contact with the enemy, which was heading toward Japan at 20 knots, but the force consisted of battleships and destroyers. Farther ahead, they found three small carriers, but they did not find any more. All this led Spruance to believe the attack had been far more successful than it was, for Ozawa had preserved six of his nine carriers. But since the American searches throughout the engagement had been so sketchy, Spruance really never knew the size and components of the force he faced. Spruance took the Indianapolis to join the fast battleships, which steamed ahead of the carriers, accompanied by the carriers Bunker Hill and Wasp for protection. They sped along all day but found no cripples, and finally turned back towards Saipan when they were 550 miles from the Philippines. He arrived back off Saipan's shore on June 23, just in time to step into a hornet's nest. On the morning of June 16, D-1, it was apparent that at Saipan there had been some serious miscalculations about Japanese defences on the part of the American High Command. The plan had called for seizure of a line along the foothills a mile behind the beach from the northern edge of attack, about two miles south of Garapan, to Agingan Point at the southern end of the island. That was to be accomplished the first day. The second day, the Marines were to capture a Slito airfield on the southern end of the island and drive clear across to Magician Bay on the eastern shore. But the plan had not allowed for the extremely effective use to which General Saito put his artillery or the excellent disposition and aim of the Japanese mortars which blanketed the beaches. As important as all that, at the end of the first day, Prisoners and documents indicated that the Americans were facing a force perhaps twice as large as the one they had expected to meet here. As the landings began, Admiral Turner had been jaunty. He predicted that the objectives would be taken and Saipan would collapse in a week. He told Admiral Spruance he thought it was feasible to launch the Guam invasion on June 18, but by the morning of June 16 all had changed. Admiral Spruance had the word that Ozawa was out looking for him with the Japanese fleet, and Admiral Turner and General Holland Smith had the bad news that their troops had not managed to get farther than halfway to their objectives on that first day, there would be no Guam invasion on June 18. The 27th Army Division, which had been established as the Saipan Reserve, and which Holland Smith distrusted intensely, would now have to be committed to the battle, and the Guam invasion force would be kept as a further reserve for Saipan, in case the battle continued to go badly. Those decisions made and arrangements completed for the protection of the invasion force by more cruisers and destroyers from the fleet. Admiral Spruance sailed off in the Indianapolis to join Admiral Mitcher, and Admiral Turner and General Smith prepared to get on with the battle. On the morning of June 16, the 6th Marines were busy mopping up after the Japanese counter-attack of the night before. There were many little pockets of Japanese resistance behind the American lines, stragglers who had not been able to get back to the ridge. It was a question of finding the Japanese in their holes and flushing them out by grenades and flamethrowers. Very few of the enemy survived in this sector. The 8th Marines and the 23rd Marines were also moving slowly. They linked up at Charankanoa Pier that morning, and thus closed a gap that had been worrisome. But the Japanese artillery fire in this area was extremely effective. Troops moved into positions that were screened from the ridges. The Japanese had no aircraft in the air, yet as soon as a troop concentration was established, the Japanese shells began coming in. It was nearly a week before the Marines discovered that the enemy had placed a soldier in the tall smokestack of the Charankanoa sugar refinery, which had survived the naval bombardment, and the soldier was directing the fire of the guns. But on the 16th, the troops moved to the edge of Lake Susupe and stopped there, and more artillery was landed all along the beaches, and more troops came in. Early on the morning of the 16th, General Schmidt had the 4th Marine Division moving in the south. Agingen Point was captured, and troops of the 25th Marines managed to reach a point half a mile from Aslito Airfield. But by the end of the day, Japanese resistance had been so stout 
that the 4th Marine Division still had not entirely reached its first day's objective. The second day at Saipan proved that the battle would be longer and more intense than the American commanders had anticipated. They had lost the impetus of the invasion. The Japanese had not been concentrated here in a small area, as at Tarawa and in the Marshalls, and so the shock value of the naval and aerial bombardment had been largely lost. The Japanese ability to stop the Americans at the ridgeline on the first day had encouraged the defenders, and their resistance was more fierce and effective on June 16. General Saito decided that day that the time had come for an offensive, and he chose to launch it on the north against the 2nd Marine Division. The three Marine regiments of the division were strung out on a ragged line that ran from the original invasion's left hank to a Fetna point. During the daylight hours of June 16, the fighting was minimal, with most of the active troops engaged in mop-up operations that removed the enemy from within their perimeter. The objective that General Saito chose to capture was the Saipan radio station, in the middle of the 2nd Division's perimeter, a quarter of a mile inside the American lines. The radio station had been wrecked in the earlier bombardments, but its site was still plainly visible. General Saito chose Colonel Takashi Goto's 9th Tank Regiment to lead the attack. The Americans had known the Japanese had many tanks on Saipan, and before the invasion they had expected to meet perhaps 200 of them in the battle. They did not know, however, that the tanks included new Japanese medium tanks, which mounted 47mm guns. Colonel Goto brought up 44 tanks in the fading hours of daylight, and at dusk prepared to lead the attack. The tanks would drive inside the 6th Marines lines to the radio station, and behind them the 136th Infantry Regiment would attack and take Charankanoa. At the same time, Lieutenant Commander Tatsu Karashima would lead the 1st Yokosuka Special Naval Landing Force south from Garapan along the coastal road to strike the flank of the 2nd Marines. Late on the afternoon of June 16, Marine observers, flying above the lines in their grasshoppers and in torpedo bombers from the escort carriers, noticed a concentration of tanks in the foothills, west of the 6th Marines line. But the tanks were not moving, nor did they give any indication of an impending attack, so there was no panic. The observers passed the word of the tank concentration to the ground troops, and the 6th Marines took note of the fact that they might have to face tanks soon. Lieutenant Colonel William K. Jones of the 6th Regiment's 1st Battalion made sure that he had Marine tanks in the area, just in case. At 3.30 in the morning of June 17, the Marines in their foxholes on the perimeter of the 1st Battalion were roused by the almost simultaneous starting up of a number of heavy engines in a valley behind the ridgeline. They could not see what was occurring and called for star shells over the area. The guns provided the light, and Jones called for the Sherman tanks that had been moved up behind the line. The noise grew louder, and ten minutes later the star shells illuminated the first of the Japanese tanks as it rumbled around a corner of the ridge and bumped down toward the Marine lines. The first tank was followed by others, and the Marines could see Japanese soldiers of the 136th Infantry clinging to the sides of the tanks as they came. Besides the Sherman tanks, Battalion Commander Jones had several self-propelled 75mm guns, 37mm anti-tank guns, a number of bazookas and grenade launchers, and the usual complement of machine guns. All these began firing as the Japanese tanks came into the regiment's sector. Above, the star shells lit the battlefield, and on the ground the air was alive with tracer and lead. A Japanese tank was hit and set afire, and in the smoky light the marines could see another behind it and one alongside. For an hour the battle raged, with Japanese tanks overrunning the American positions, then being stopped by gunfire from front and rear. One tank after another was disabled. The Japanese infantrymen coming behind to consolidate the positions found themselves in the midst of the marines, but without the tank support that was supposed to make their task easy. They dropped to the ground and began firing their rifles, the Marines responded, and the din grew. In the north, Lieutenant Commander Karashima's special landing force was to coordinate with this attack, which spilled over into the right hank of the 2nd Marines, and hit the 2nd from the other side. But Karashima was slow arriving, 
and when he came there was no brave frontal attack along the road to split the marines and join up with the troops of the 136th. Perhaps Karashima could tell what was happening on the other side, for his troops never committed themselves. They held back and attacked the second's flank with mortars, but there was no infantry drive. Lieutenant Colonel Jones could be thankful for that. He had his hands full with the Japanese tank attack, and it could have split the regiment and isolated the marines north of the radio station had it succeeded. By 5.30am it was apparent that the Japanese attack had been blunted, and by 6am the surviving tanks were turning and heading back toward the ridgeline and their valley. By 7am the battlefield was still enough that the sound of single rifle shots could be heard, as the marines hunted out little pockets of Japanese infantrymen who had become trapped behind the reformed perimeter. Twenty-four Japanese tanks lay smouldering in the sand and brush, and the 9th Tank Regiment's striking force had been all but wiped out. Colonel Goto had few reinforcements. Two companies of his tanks and part of a third, 40% of his force, had been sent to Guam several weeks earlier. The dozen or so tanks that remained were all that was left of his unit. Colonel Yukitsume Ogawa counted the dead and missing from his 136th Regiment. He had lost 300 men, and the attack had failed. The Japanese did not know it, but they had mauled the Marines severely. The 1st Battalion of the 6th Marines had lost almost the equivalent of a rifle company, and the regiment had lost many of its artillery pieces in the Japanese shelling that accompanied the tank drive. The casualty list for the Saipan operation was over 3,000 and rising. That night, General Holland Smith had ordered the 27th Division to begin landing its troops, and it was apparent he would need these reserves if the Marines were to move ahead. The 165th Army Infantry was to help break out from the coastal plain and over the ridge line that had stopped the Americans so far. The plan now called for the Americans to drive north to Garapan and for other forces to push across to Magician Bay, thus sealing off the southern half of the island below Mount Tapochao. The attack would be three-directional. The 2nd Marines would drive north, the 6th Marines would move northwest toward Mount Tapochao, and the 8th Marines would cross the marshes of Lake Susupa. The Japanese tanks were still burning at 7pm when the Marines attacked. The 2nd Marines were to move halfway to Garapan and then stop and dig in. They achieved their objective in three hours with very little fighting. The 6th Marines also had the advantage of the blunted Japanese attack of the night before. They moved up to the foothills of Mount Tipo Pal, the mountain that jutted up in front of Tapochao and by late afternoon they were on their assigned line and had been reinforced. The 8th Marines bore the burden of the attack this day. Those on the left, who faced sloping ground to the top of the ridge, had fairly easy going. Deprived of their tank support, the Japanese had fallen back in this area, but in the swamps along the edge of Lake Susupe, the enemy took advantage of the difficult terrain to move up snipers, who were most effective. The Marines' equipment bogged down in the swamp, and as they struggled to free it, they came under sniper fire. Movement had to stop while riflemen went out to find the snipers. The Japanese concentrated their machine guns and rifle positions in a grove of palm trees and along the edge of Therridge back of the coastal plain above the swamp. The fire was effective, and the Marines suffered many casualties. Four tanks came along the coastal road, and Lieutenant Colonel Rathvon Tompkins commanded them for his fight. The tanks fired on the Japanese along the ridge and kept their heads down, while the Marines moved up the ridge and captured the position. The Palm Grove proved troublesome most of the afternoon, but after the ridge line was secured, the Marines tried to dislodge the enemy there. They brought up mortars and fired steadily, but the Japanese were obviously in prepared defences, and the mortar fire did not end the resistance. As it was growing late, Tompkins dug in for the night, leaving the Japanese in possession of the palm grove. Since he did not know how many enemy there were in this place, he brought forward several 75mm self-propelled guns to protect against a possible night counter-attack, while the Marines were driving along the island. Colonel Gerard Kelly's 165th Infantry was assigned the job of taking Aslito Airfield, which lay south of the Marine perimeter held by the 25th Marines. The army men attacked with the usual army tactics, along a broad line, moving up slowly, and making sure of superiority before moving again. 
The Japanese defences here at first were minimal, so the army troops moved relatively quickly, but as the direction of the drive became apparent to the Japanese, and resistance increased. From Egingen Point, the 165th moved toward Cape Obium on the southern shore of the island. Beyond the cape, inland, lay the ridge line back from the coastal plain, and beyond the ridge lay a Slito airfield, their destination. But before they could take the airfield, they had to take the ridge, and the Japanese had the advantage of the high ground. Late in the afternoon, the 165th attacked up the hill, but the troops were driven back by a determined Japanese counterattack. On the north, another battalion of the 165th had moved within a few yards of the Aslito runways, but with its right flank pushed back, the regiment halted for the night and dug in, along a broad if wavering front. North of the 165th, Colonel Batchelder's 25th Marines attacked in Marine fashion, which was to strike like an arrow for an objective. The differences in techniques could be seen very clearly in this action. The 25th Marines moved forward in a column to a point 1,500 yards from their jump-off position, taking the ridge beyond the airfield and securing the north end from Japanese reinforcement. Batchelder discovered late in the afternoon that the Japanese had abandoned the airfield, and he informed Colonel Kelly. But the army, which might have occupied the airfield and straightened up the perimeter, refused to move. The 165th had a good defensive position for the night and did not want to sacrifice it. Thus the marines were out on a limb with a gap between their ridge line and the army back along the west side of the airfield. Directly north of the 25th marines were the men of the 24th, who had faced strong opposition from the Japanese all day, and some complications of their own. Japanese artillery at Nafutan Point had proved very troublesome in stalling the advance that was supposed to take the 24th about midway along the north-south axis of the island. They were supposed to hit and dig in. On their left, the 23rd Marines had an even more difficult time on the 17th. A group of soldiers from the well-trained Japanese 47th Independent Mixed Brigade held the position they were supposed to take. They held it all day, in spite of repeated attacks, and they were well entrenched, and they had a three-inch gun and several 40 millimeter guns. But the worst difficulty of the day came from the Marines' own lines. At about three in the afternoon, one unit of the 23rd called for help. The help proved to be quite sophisticated, coming from one of the new provisional rocket detachments which was equipped with heavy trucks on which rocket launchers were mounted. The rocket launchers came up and fired a wave of 4.5-inch missiles at the enemy. But the missiles were wrongly aimed, and they struck in, misfire, the middle of the 2nd Battalion of the 24th Marines, causing 20 casualties. It seemed hardly fair to have to face fire from behind as well as from the front, but the Marines rallied and went on. A few yards farther along they saw their objective, the ridge line ahead, and they moved, and as they did so from the face of a cliff came a shattering fire from machine guns and rifles. The ground on which the Marines were moving was open land, with coral just beneath the surface, and there was no way to dig a foxhole in this stuff, and they were trapped. There was only one answer, retreat, and they did till they found a point where they could dig in. The advance that day of a little more than a mile had cost the battalion 57 casualties, as compared to the 72 casualties suffered by the whole 165th Regiment in the same day's fighting. As evening came and dusk descended on Saipan, the Japanese made their first effort to support Admiral Ozawa's Ego plan in the air. Half a dozen planes from Truk flew towards Saipan to attack the invasion forces. They found the transports containing the invasion reserves, later destined for Guam, and attacked them. The transports and their destroyers shot down three of the bombers, but one torpedo bomber got through and its torpedo hit and landing craft infantry, causing 20 casualties. In terms of the Japanese effort involved, it was a waste of a torpedo, although to the men of the ship it was a deadly matter. The landing craft infantry was taken in tow, but sank before it could reach port, and it was the only casualty of the transports in the raid. A much larger force from Yap attacked later that evening. The combat air patrols from the escort carriers shot down a number of the planes, but several bombers and torpedo planes got through to the carriers, which were operating as a group off the Saipan shore.
The Fanshawe Bay was hit by a bomb that exploded below the flight deck, starting fires and killing and wounding a number of men. The fires were controlled, but the Fanshawe Bay could not operate, so she headed back to Enivatok for repairs. The Coral Sea took several near misses, and so did the Gambia Bay. For most of the men of these ships, this was the first action. They comported themselves very well. There was a certain amount of confusion in the air, and some shooting by American ships at American planes. But a number of the Japanese bombers were destroyed by fighters, and several by the gun crews of the carriers. With the usual aviator ebullience, the Japanese pilots returned to base talking of their exploits. They identified the carriers, but confused them with the big fleet carriers of Admiral Mitch's force. There was quite a difference. A fleet carrier, such as the Yorktown, carried 86 fighters and bombers. An escort carrier of the Kaiser class, which most of these were, carried about 30 planes. This improper identification cheered the Japanese commanders, and was partly responsible for Admiral Kurita's erroneous reports to Admiral Ozawa. On the night of June 17, General Saito regrouped his forces for the defence. Apparently he expected a counter-invasion from nearby Tinian, for the Aslito airfield garrison had moved to Nafutan Point, which was virtually surrounded by the Americans. The majority of the Japanese troops, however, fell back to a lean that ran from Garapan down along the ridge line to Mount Tapochao, and then to the eastern shore of the island. The Japanese still occupied two-thirds of the island then, and abandoned the southern third to the invaders. The territory they held was far more rugged than anything the Americans had yet encountered, ideally suited for defence. The difficulties that lay ahead were concealed on the morning of June 18, however, by the ease with which the Americans were able to advance. The Army's 165th Regimental Combat Team took Aslito Airfield without trouble. The Marines moved swiftly across the island to Magician Bay. General Holland Smith had moved his headquarters ashore to Charon Kanoa on the night of June 17, and so had General Ralph Smith of the 27th Infantry Division. The decision of Admiral Spruance to leave the invasion force had its first repercussions this day on the land battle. The 105th Army Infantry landed, but it was discovered that its supply train had been loaded aboard other transports, which had sailed by Admiral Spruance's order away from the beach to minimise the danger of Japanese aerial attack, so the troops were ashore but their equipment was not. Colonel Leonard Bishop did the best he could. He sent his Mento round up and repair Japanese trucks, and they ran them for a week. But because the regiment's supplies were missing, General Holland Smith kept them at the rear of the 4th Marine Division to guard against an enemy counter-attack. On the morning of June 18, it was apparent that the fate of the Saipan garrison was already determined, unless General Saito could receive troop support from Guam or some other island. Colonel Robert Hogaboom, the operations officer on General Holland Smith's staff, reported that the Japanese defences were weakening. On the night before, the Japanese had mounted a handful of small attacks, but they had been minor and easily repelled. The most serious threat had been an attempt to send about 30 landing barges from Tanapag to land behind the Marines, but the Navy had been alert to this, and about half the barges were sunk by destroyers and gunboats, and a few by Marine artillery from the beach. The invasion failed, and the troops of the 135th Infantry Division went back to Tanapag. On the morning of the 18th, even Tokyo seemed aware of the course of the battle. Premier Hideki Tojo sent a message to General Saito on Saipan to inspire the troops. But the inspiration consisted of abjuration to do their duty and die for the Emperor. It was hardly a victory message. General Saito's response was even more indicative of the state of affairs on the Japanese side of the lines. By becoming the bulwark of the Pacific with 10,000 deaths, we hope to requite imperial favour, he radioed. Imperial favour they would have but it would be lavished on them at the Yasukuni Shrine where the military heroes of the nation were revered. General Saito knew that he would never need another promotion. The abandonment of Aslito Airfield meant that within a few days the Americans would be able to operate land-based aircraft there, and that meant disaster. Already the Seabees were ashore, plugging the bomb craters in the runways and salvaging buildings and equipment, 
The ease with which Marine and Army troops moved on the morning of June 18 was comforting, but it did not last. The moment they came to the ridgeline, they found the Japanese dug in and waiting. The 8th Marines captured their coconut grove below the ridge, which had been largely abandoned, but when they got past that point, they were stalled. The 23rd and 24th Marines moved forward to the ridge, but could not get over it, and at nightfall had to move back to find defensive positions. The Marines also moved to the shore of Magician Bay, thus isolating the Nafutan Point garrison completely. The Japanese mounted only one action that day. Two tanks came down from the ridgeline and moved along the American perimeter, firing, but when the artillery began shooting at them, they prudently retired. A sample of the coming pattern was given the Marines on the east coast. The 24th Marines came to a cliff that was dotted with caves full of Japanese defenders. There was no way to make a sweep. The Japanese had to be routed cave by cave. The job was given to the 25th Marines, the 4th Division Reserve, and they spent the whole day at it. The demolition men brought up satchel charges, and the flamethrowers were broken out, and each cave was scoured. Some caves were too deep to clear, and these were blasted so that the entrances were sealed, and the Japanese left to a particularly unpleasant death. The Marines had been critical of the 165th Army Regiment's failure to take Aslito Airfield when it was discovered to be deserted on the evening of June 16. These frictions continued and were multiplied. Colonel Kelly did not know whether he was to continue to report to General Schmidt, the 4th Marines commander who had directed operations on that first day, or to General Ralph Smith, his own divisional commander, who had landed and set up a command post. Kelly telephoned 4th Marine Division headquarters, but did not get a definitive answer. He spoke to General Ralph Smith, who indicated that of course the 165th would now come back under Army command. After conferring with Ralph Smith, Colonel Kelly attacked the Japanese along the ridgeline in his sector, without orders from the 4th Marines. Since the Japanese had already written off the whole area, the attack was easily successful, so little was said, but General Schmidt did not like army colonels taking action in his command zone without orders. As night fell on June 18, the matter of command was still not resolved. That night, General Saito elaborated on his defence plans. Seeing the work of the CBs at Aslito Airfield, he ordered the forward units to make a series of infiltration attacks, not to capture the airfield, which he knew he could not hold, but to destroy installations and prevent the Americans from using the field. He was still hoping for reinforcement. The AGO plan promised that, and as the Japanese fleet came forth searching for the Americans, Imperial General Headquarters sent messages of inspiration and hope. The great Japanese naval victory in a day or two would change everything, but at the 31st Army's intelligence section, the Japanese officers began burning their code books and papers that referred to defence of other areas of the inner empire. You will hold Saipan, said one exuberant message from Tokyo, and if Saipan is lost, air raids on Tokyo will take place often, therefore you will hold. Obviously, there was some very intelligent observation going on in Tokyo, although obfuscated by the growing need to phrase every message of despair in euphemisms. The going for the Americans had slowed down. General Holland Smith wanted those transports back off the beaches with their precious loads of ammunition and supply, before he launched any major attack. Admiral Turner, told that supplies on the beach were running low, said that he had his orders and the transports were held back, except for those carrying supplies General Smith said were needed desperately, and would be unloaded immediately. The Marines, seeing the transports leave and not come back, began to feel as they had at Guadalcanal, when Admiral Turner's supply ships had been forced to sail away, leaving them stranded because of Japanese air and sea control of the island in the first days of the American invasion. So while the Marines and the Army did move on the 19th, they did not move far. On the night of June 19 through 20, the Japanese began their harassing attacks. A unit of about 75 soldiers moved forward on the positions of the 24th Marines, attacked the perimeter, fought for a time and then retreated. A smaller unit in the sector of the 6th Marines did the same. Early on June 20, the Americans advanced again to the high point of ground called Hill 500. They did not take the hill, 
but moved to be in a position to do so. That day, General Saito had some bad news from his operations officers, and they told him that almost half of the 43rd Division had been wiped out. It had lost two-thirds of its artillery. The 47th Mixed Brigade had lost all its artillery and was so scattered that the command could not even estimate the number of units still fighting. Three rifle battalions had been organised from among the stragglers stranded on Saipan, and these had been decimated. The engineers were down to half strength, and the anti-aircraft artillery was too. About 20% of the total military force had been killed, wounded or captured. The attack on Hill 500 came in the middle of the morning of June 20. Colonel Batchelder's 25th Marines were assigned the task of capturing the hill. First, the artillery laid down a smoke barrage, and then the troops moved. 500 yards below the crest they stopped and reorganised, and then began the ascent. The Japanese were mostly concealed in caves on the hillside, and each of these had to be flushed out or sealed in. The task took all afternoon. When the fight for Hill 500 ended, the Marines counted 44 dead Japanese defenders, but they could not count the number dead in the caves. The Marines had suffered about 50 casualties, far less than they had expected, because the Japanese had drawn back to a new defence line and did not seriously contest the terrain. The biggest surprise of the day was the explosion of a Japanese ammunition dump in the 24th Marines area, on the Magician Bay side of the island. Several Marines were killed or wounded. In the south, General Ralph Smith's 27th Division Army troops moved forward satisfactorily moving forward about two-thirds of a mile. The big news of the day, as far as Admiral Turner was concerned, was the completion of the repairs to Aslito Airfield. The first American planes arrived that evening. To Turner this meant the Army Air Force could move in land-based fighters and bombers, and the responsibility of the escort carriers for air protection was ended. That had been one worrisome aspect of Admiral Spruance's departure with Task Force 58 to meet the Japanese fleet, if the Japanese had somehow mounted a sustained air attack on the ships of the amphibious force, the hundred planes of the escort carriers might not have been able to contain them. The 165th Infantry Division, which had captured the airfield, had exercised the usual prerogative of giving it an English language name. They chose to call it Conroy Field, in honour of Colonel Gardiner J. Conroy, the regimental commander who had been killed at Makin in the Gilberts. The Navy demurred and promptly renamed the field Isley Field, in honour of Commander Robert H. Isley, commander of Torpedo Squadron 16, the Lexington's Torpedo Squadron, who had been killed there on a pre-invasion airstrike. The Navy name became official and stuck to the annoyance of the officers and men of the 27th Division. At the end of June 20, the Americans had straightened out their lines and held all of southern Saipan except the redoubt at Nafutan Point, which was going to be left hanging on a little longer since it did not threaten any position. The Marines and Army troops were up against General Saito's new line of defence and ready to attack. On June 21, the Marines reorganised, and they brought supplies up from the beaches to points closer to the line. Some units were set to scouring the marshes around Lake Susupa. They killed a number of Japanese holed up there, but some escaped, they offered no threat except occasionally to come out and snipe at passers-by, and they were, in other words, dangerous to individuals, but not to the command. Troops of the 2nd Marines were engaged in scouting activities. They tried to ascertain the condition and extent of General Saito's defences, without much success. On Hill 500, the Marines continued to try to close up every crevice. A few Japanese were persuaded to surrender, but most fought to the end. General Holland Smith ordered General Ralph Smith's 27th Division troops to move up north of Aslito Airfield and go into reserve for the Marines. One battalion of the division could be left behind to clear out Nafutan Point, but the rest were to join the general advance. When General Ralph Smith received that order, he met with his commanders. They argued that it would take a regiment to clear up Nafutan Point, the Japanese were holed up there in stout defences since the army's style of fighting employed a large number of troops and lots of artillery and tank support to keep casualties down. Ralph Smith conferred and considered for five hours. Then he telephoned Holland Smith, 
and asked that he be allowed to assign a regiment to the Nafutan Point task. Holland Smith concurred, as long as Ralph Smith would hold one battalion in reserve for Holland Smith's use elsewhere on the island. Ralph Smith then ordered the 105th Infantry to hold the current line at Nafutan Point, with two battalions on the line and a third battalion in reserve. He said nothing to the regimental commander about keeping one battalion free for Holland Smith's employment. He said nothing about continuing the attack that day on Nafutan Point, as General Holland Smith had indicated in his order earlier. The 105th was to hold when it moved into position at 6.30am on June 22, replacing the 165th Army Infantry. All this activity on the night of June 21 presaged a new American attack the next day. That night the Japanese prepared. Along the line they infiltrated and learned what they could about American movements. Back on the beach, a handful of Japanese holdouts who had concealed themselves for five days came out and blew up an ammunition dump on Green Beach 1. The cache exploded with a roar, and then fireworks continued all night long, sending streaks of light and hashes all across the island. It was a fitting overture for the next day. The initial American drive had ended with the capture of Aslito Airfield and the flat ground that led to the mountains. The Americans were in control of the coastal plain. Now they would have to assault the secondary defence line, which was far stronger than anything they had yet seen on Saipan. General Holland Smith's command had suffered 6,100 casualties in six days of fighting, far more than had been expected in the planning days at Pearl Harbour. But fortunately, the Guam invasion had been postponed, and so Holland Smith had those troops to back up his Marines. On June 22, he expected the Marines to advance about 2.5 miles and capture Mount Tipopele and Mount Tapochao. General Ralph Smith's 27th Division troops were to be the reserve, and General Holland Smith did not know how he might have to employ them, so he ordered Ralph Smith to select two routes, one leading to the 2nd Marine Division front and the other to the 4th Division. It might go either way. The 2nd Division moved out at Sixin the morning of June 22, toward the slopes of Mount Tipo Pile. They reached the slope early in the afternoon, having encountered only token resistance. The 6th Marine Regiment advanced up the slope. One company of its 3rd Battalion moved around the entrance to a ravine and up the hill to the top. They could not go down the other side, however, because they were on a steep cliff, with a drop of more than 1,000 feet to the bottom. Meanwhile, a platoon of the 6th Marines had investigated the bypassed ravine and found it alive with Japanese. They were dug into the sides of the hill, and the Marines soon found the Japanese had interconnecting tunnels. Mount Tipo Pale was like a hand, with the ravine fingers deep into the hill, and the ravines were connected by tunnels through the fingers. This made it necessary to maintain a constant pressure on the base of the hill, and that meant employment of troops who otherwise would be moving ahead. The 4th Marine Division also ran into heavier resistance this day. General Schmidt had told his commanders to advance about a mile and a quarter to the base of Hill 600, but the terrain was not much like that indicated on the maps. One of the difficulties of the whole Central Pacific campaign had been charts and maps, because the Japanese had kept the area bottled up for 25 years, and there simply were no proper maps in American hands. The 4th Division's advance was to be made through four sets of ridges and valleys. At the first one they ran into a determined Japanese force that attacked them as they came up. When the fight was over, the Japanese had lost 90 men killed, but the Americans had been hurt badly too. The commander of the 3rd Battalion's Company K was killed in the assault, his place was taken by another officer, and he was killed, and his place was taken by another, and he was killed. Finally that position was taken, but the story was repeated during the day, so that at the end of June 22, the 4th Division had advanced just half as far as General Holland Smith had expected, and that only in part of the area. The 24th Marines had gotten less than halfway. Late that afternoon, when General Holland Smith discovered how the going was, he decided it was time to commit the reserves of the 27th Division to the fight. He outlined a plan of advance for the next day that would put the Americans into the village of Lao Lao, on the northeastern shore of Magician Bay, and across Mount Tapochao in the centre of the island, and half a mile south of Garapan on the west. To do this, he would use the 27th Division, which was rested, 
they would attack the next morning, passing through the 25th Marines to take Mount Tapochao. General Holland Smith did not know that along the line across the island, General Saito had concentrated his defences, nor that he faced 15,000 determined defenders.